Uh, I'm David Lamb. I'm director of the Institute for Social Research, and I'm a professor in the Department of Economics. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you here to this bicentennial symposium, Impact on Inequality. I wanted to just tell you a little bit about how the symposium came to be and thank some people, and then we'll get right into the first session. Um, the idea for this symposium really began um, about two years ago in late 2015, the University Bicentennial Committee requested proposals for activities for the bicentennial year. And um, I began working with uh, Susan Collins, who's going to talk to you soon, who was dean of the Ford School until recently. And uh, we had the idea of trying to put together a symposium that would reflect the strengths of the social sciences at the University of Michigan over uh, many decades and would focus on the uh, incredible group of uh, alumni that have been produced uh, here at Michigan uh, in the social sciences. And we wanted to give it a, a substantive focus and we thought focusing on many dimensions of inequality and the contributions that Michigan social science has made uh, and that these uh, alumni have made to research on uh, inequality in many dimensions would be a good focus. We got uh, approval from the Bicentennial Committee, got some funding from them, began working with an excellent um, committee from across campus representing the major units uh, in, the, in the social sciences, and we began asking department chairs and deans and faculty about uh, alumni in their fields uh, in the social sciences working in various dimensions of, uh, of inequality and, you know, within a couple of weeks had, a, had dozens of people. It was clear we were going to have to make some uh, decisions and uh, we ended up with a, a great group of uh, 30 uh, alumni that's represented here and I encourage you to look through their very impressive bios. In fact, their, the bios are also impressive that we're not going to try to give real introductions to everybody during the, during the program, but encourage you to, uh, to read them. It's, a, it's an amazing list, and we've tried to represent a wide variety of disciplines and schools and colleges and uh, junior and senior people. It's, uh, it's a really a, a, a very, it was really fun uh, putting it together, and we got great cooperation from the people uh, that we invited. We ended up with these 30 uh, alumni, they represent nine different schools and colleges, and that's not even counting all the many departments within those schools and colleges. So it really represents uh, the entire university, a wide range of disciplines, a wide range of methodologies, a wide range of substantive topics. I think it really uh, reflects the, the great uh, tradition in social sciences at the University of Michigan. I want to thank the, uh, uh, the committee, which is listed here on the back. So. Susan and I were co-chairs. Uh, we had uh, Cleo Caldwell representing uh, public health, and all of these committee also have many hats, but I'll just identify them by the unit that we thought of them as representing on the committee. Uh, Liz Cole represented the uh, College of Literature, Science, and Arts, Jorge Delva, uh, the School of Social Work, Carla O'Connor, uh, School of Education. So we had six units represented on the committee. We ended up with even more uh, units represented among the people uh, that we invited. So it was great working with that, uh, that committee and, and really a fun kind of cross-campus uh, activity. Uh, we had uh, a lot of support from the staff listed here, and I just want to uh, flag all of them. Uh, Tara Ingholm was the key staff member in ISR uh, working on organizing the program, and uh, many of the um, alumni coming in had a lot of interaction with her. Uh, Anna Massey from ISR, Catherine Carver and Shelley Connor from the Alumni Association, and Emily Hickey and Laura Lee uh, from the Ford School. Uh, and it was, a, it was really a very nice collaboration between ISR and the, and the Ford School and the Alumni Association putting it all uh, together. We also had financial support from many, many units, and we got great cooperation. Uh, major funding was from the Bicentennial Committee. We had funding from ISR, the Ford School, Alumni Association, School of Education, LSNA, Public Health, Social Work, Rackham Graduate School, where we're hosted in this beautiful building, and um, the, the Law School and the Ross School of Business and Poverty Solutions. So it's really been a campus-wide effort and really a very, very, uh, uh, very rewarding to put it all together. So I want to turn things over now to uh, Susan Collins, the co-chair, and it's been great working with her. She was dean of the Ford School until the summer when she finished her very successful 10 years as, as a dean, and she worked on this committee in that capacity and 
brought together ISR and the Ford School in a great way. So, Susan. Um, thank you very much, David. And uh, I don't want to repeat what uh, David has already said, but just one sentence um, that this idea really was David's, and I was just delighted to be asked to work with him and to work with so many people from across <laughs> campus because um, the University of Michigan has had such a huge impact on the topic of the symposium today, looking at various dimensions of inequality, socioeconomic, gender, racial inequality. Our challenge was that there are so many ways that it's had an impact. A lot of the conference, as you'll see, will focus on the impact through research. And then the last session this uh, afternoon will focus more broadly on many different ways to have an impact in those uh, dimensions. But we also are very well aware of the fact that there are so many people here on campus now who are actively engaged in work in this area. And so while we are absolutely thrilled by the 30 alumni who um, we have been able to bring back and are just delighted to be able to engage with them and hopefully make new connections in a lot of different ways, we're also really looking forward to the conversation that we hope to have in each of the sessions. And so I'd like to welcome and invite each of you to think about your comments and your questions. After the presentations, each of the sessions will have um, an active uh, opportunity for a conversation. And I think this, this beautiful room, while it does hold people and we are expecting other folks to be joining, um, it's, you know, it's very uh, congenial. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Rob Sellers. And I don't believe in long introductions, but I, I do have the honor of just saying a couple of words about him. I'm not going to repeat what's in the program. I think um, all of you know that he is Chief Diversity Officer and that he heads up um, equity and inclusion for the university. When I first got to know him, he was chair of the psychology department. And in that capacity, was not only known as a champion for students and mentoring faculty, but also as a stellar researcher in his own right. And um, I don't know how much he will have a chance to talk about some of his work in the context of inequality as part of the panel, but um, from that perspective, we were just delighted to invite him as one of our distinguished alumni of the university also to moderate the first panel, which will be on education disparities. And so we're looking forward to that. It also is particularly fitting because, as David mentioned, this really is an effort that is cross campus. And so to have someone who um, represents the university at the highest levels, and also that it turned out that this is part of the university's week on diversity, equity, and inclusion, all of those stars aligned in a variety of different ways. And so it's really um, a great pleasure for me to um, both welcome Rob to say a couple of uh, some introductory remarks to get us started, and then um, to moderate the first panel. So Rob, welcome. Thank you, David. So, I, good morning, everyone. Uh, come on now. Good morning, everyone. All right. We are uh, very, very fortunate and um, uh, to be here today uh, to enjoy what I uh, what I anticipate to be an extremely exciting uh, series of panels, both today uh, and tomorrow. Uh, panels that are extremely timely. So even though this is part of the university bicentennial, it is also extremely relevant to uh, who we are as an institution today and the challenges that we uh, face as a broader society. I want to first thank both Susan and David for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to participate. Uh, I just wish that I uh, would be able to participate uh, longer and uh, more fully in the uh, events over the next couple of days, but I will be here in complete and total spirit. Um, uh, so even if you don't see me, I'm kind of like the moon during the day. I'm always <laughs> there. The uh, symposia over these next two days are not only important in the context of the university bicentennial, but they're also happening, as Susan mentioned, in the context of the university's first diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, summit. 
And this summit celebrates our first year of implementation with respect to our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. And this strategic plan is a tangible um, dedication and commitment and pledge that the university has made to make sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not only a core value of this institution, but is also standard operating procedure. And there's lots of ways in which uh, the symposia, uh, symposium fits within that uh, broader goal and those broader efforts. First and foremost, when we started the uh, DEI planning process, uh, it was very important that it wasn't simply a diversity process. That diversity without issues of equity and inclusion, addressing issues of social justice, um, it, without that is quite hollow uh, and really a, a pipe dream. That true diversity also must address issues of inequality, also must address issues of inclusion. And so as we move forward in our efforts, it's not only important that we address uh, representational diversity, but that we also understand the differential opportunity structure that exists within the university. So President Schlissel is often fond to um, point out that while talent is equally distributed everywhere, opportunity is not. And so as we move forward in our efforts, it is extremely important that we consider that. The second reason why this symposia is particularly relevant for our DEI Summit Week is that within the strategic plans, we have three major themes, strategic themes. One uh, really focuses around the recruitment, retention, and uh, development of all of our um, uh, faculty, students, and staff. So it's really a, a person-focused uh, approach. The second theme uh, focuses on creating an inclusive and equitable climate. And I like to think about that in terms of a process-focused theme. And then third, it is to infuse diversity, equity, and inclusion in our scholarship, our teaching, and our service. And really, that's the product of this university. That's the mission of this university. And if diversity, equity, and inclusion is going to be not only a, um, uh, a core principle, but, and, but also a uh, part of our standard operating procedure, then Diversity, equity, and inclusion needs to be a part of our scholarship. One of the great things about this university is that we have a long and distinguished history, which is embodied by our panelists today and tomorrow in addressing issues of inequality, in addressing issues related to diversity and inclusion. And so today and tomorrow, we continue that tradition as we attempt to build on that through our strategic plan to impact uh, the larger field and society at broad. So I'm very happy to be here. And uh, given that, I know you didn't come here to hear me. Uh, the folks that you've come to hear are all ready to present. And let's get ready to move into our very first panel. And our very first uh, panel discussion uh, focuses on perhaps the most important opportunity structure within our society, and that's education. And it's entitled, Educational Disparities in the US, Are We Making Progress? We have four distinguished uh, panelists today, and I'm gonna ask uh, each to uh, come up one by one to, um, um, present their 15 minute, 15 minute uh, presentation. Uh, and then uh, they'll go back, sit down in the audience so that they can have an opportunity um, to, to see the other presentations. And after our last presenter, we will then um, move to um, uh, a question and answer period. And at which time, uh, 
will ask that if you have questions or comments to raise your hands, uh, I will uh, call upon you and we've got microphones that will be uh, brought to you and we'll engage in a conversation, in a set of uh, discussions. I'm also gonna invite the panelists to engage uh, with each other as well as we move forward. So, without any further ado, it is my great honor to uh, introduce our first panelist. And taking Susan's lead, I'm not giving long introductions because the, all that you would uh, want to know and need to know about this panel is located in your programs. So, I'm just going to save the time for the panelists to speak. First up is Antonio R. Flores who is president and CEO of Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, HACU. Uh, he has received his PhD here from the University of Michigan uh, in Higher Education Administration in 1990. So Antonio, would you please join us at the podium? Thank you for uh, that introduction, Professor Sellers. Uh, buenos dias. Buenos dias. I think we can do better than that. <laughs> buenos dias. Buenos dias. Wow, I'm impressed. Bilingual audience here. Uh, but uh, I'm delighted to be here with all of you this morning uh, because obviously this is uh, a very uh, dear to my heart institution uh, where I spent a good part of my time in the U.S. I want to uh, also share with you that I'm an immigrant from Mexico. I uh, came to the U.S. at the tender age of 25 without uh, the benefit of uh, the English language. While I went through high school and college, uh, no one suggested to me that taking French was not a good idea. Then my chances of going to France were almost nil. And uh, maybe I could come to the US someday. And so I had to start from scratch and came to the Midwest uh, when I first uh, arrived to the US for my first year in Wisconsin and then the rest in Michigan. And now uh, that I live in Texas where the Hispanic Association of College Universities is based in San Antonio and have been there for now 20 years. Uh, my friends still question me about the lack of a, of a Texas drawl in my accent. <laughs> and I have to explain to them that I really uh, learned my English in, in Michigan for the most part, and that is uh, my English is not a Tex-Mex type, but it's a Mitch-Mex type. <laughs> And so uh, we cleared it out and move on with the business of uh, what is that we do at the Hispanic Association of College Universities, which is a nationally and internationally now uh, recognized organization that represents about 472 colleges and universities throughout the country and Puerto Rico. And uh, of course, we are uh, grateful that this uh, very fine university is part of our association. Uh, the bulk of our member institutions are those that enroll the overwhelming majority of Hispanics in the country. Uh, and in fact, about two out of every three uh, Latinos who attend college today uh, go to one of our universities. And that is 3.5 million Hispanics uh, that are in college today. Um, and of course, they also enroll uh, a diversity of students from all walks of life and are very diverse institutions. And I want to give you that additional insight only because it's important that as I uh, make my remarks, uh, it is clear that I do have a bias and it's a very strong one and it is a one that is grounded in my work as far as advocating for Latino higher education success without excluding other uh, populations that obviously we are uh, uh, identify with in terms of their quest for access to educational opportunity and success and with uh, those that we work very closely as well. But I want to uh, basically do three things today. One is to give you a sense of uh, not so much as a researcher but as a practitioner 
and, and a practitioner not of, obviously of institutional management or teaching, but of uh, advocacy and policy advocacy uh, to that end. And uh, uh, we, in that sense, are more consumers of research, uh, users of research, uh, to inform our policy, uh, our policy analysis and uh, presentation of information to members of Congress, to state legislatures, and others who are willing to listen to us. And of course, I, I say this because what I'm going to cover is mainly uh, through the lens of uh, policy advocacy uh, at the national level particularly, but of course I will mention a few states that are of a special importance to our work. And I want to first uh, commend, obviously, uh, Dean Collins and, and Director Lamb for organizing this symposium and our my fellow panelists for being part of the conversation today and all of you for uh, engaging yourselves in this session. And I want to also uh, remind myself that, uh, you know, it was here at this institution where I really learned much of what I now use in my work and in places where you really need to have your facts together in a way that is compelling and that it is documentable and that is going to make a difference for students, for institutions. And uh, I want to cover some of the questions that uh, Dr. Lamb posed to the panel as uh, part of our preparation to, to frame our presentation. And I'll do it very quickly, and then I will move into remarks that relate to the very questions that he raised. He asked us to discuss what are some of the essential facts uh, to know about your work on the topic, on the topic of disparities in education. And of course, uh, I already said a few things about my background, and uh, my work, again, is, is mainly uh, to advocate for policy changes uh, at the national and state levels, particularly to advance educational opportunity for Latinos across the country, uh, but of course for underserved populations in general. Uh, what is the fact, what is the fact that runs counter to expectations? Uh, in, in my view, the main fact is that the persistent gaps in educational attainment across different uh, racial ethnic populations in the nation uh, is just not something that we can accept as a nation and that we need to step up to correct. But this is something that is one in counter expectations. Uh, I arrived to this country, well, again, I, I was 25. This is back in the 1970s. And obviously, as a newcomer, I, I wasn't really sure of what I was uh, getting into when I would uh, try to understand uh, civil rights issues, the legislation that had just been enacted in recent years and was still getting off the ground. And yet, uh, in, in my mind, I thought the country was in the right direction back then and moving uh, somewhat at a good pace. But then he, here we are more than 40 years since then, and really we are not where I was hoping back then we would be, uh, because uh, the gaps not only persist, but in fact in some instances have uh, widened. And, and so that is really something that runs counter my expectations anyway. And now the, the other question raised by David is, what is the partner or trend that shows Good news in your field. Obviously, in, in, in our work, we are very, uh, we are very um, encouraged by the fact that minority populations, particularly low-income populations in general, uh, have continued to improve in their educational attainment. In fact, the entire country has moved up. And that is very encouraging that uh, obviously more 
uh, young people of color particularly have, uh, are graduating from high school at higher rates and entering college also at uh, higher rates than back, than back in, in, say, the last part of the last century. Uh, but that is encouraging. In other words, it's encouraging to see that we all are moving up. It is, it is not a good thing that not all of us and all the different populations <laughs> Uh, racially and ethnically speaking in the country are moving at the same pace. We are not. Uh, and so uh, the fourth question that he raised is uh, what is a pattern or trend that shows bad news in your field? I, I mentioned that already. What are also, uh, we are also eager to, sh to have you talk about the links between research, especially in your own research and policy in this area. Of course, I mentioned that we are mainly consumers of research and we use it widely to prepare our policy recommendations to members of Congress and others. Now, on September 26, a Washington Post headline read, by age three, inequality is clear, rich kids attend school, poor kids stay with a grandparent. And this was making reference to a book that was discussed by that article. Uh, and the writer of this article, Heather Long, goes on to report that only 55% of America's three and four year olds attend a formal preschool, a rate far below China, Germany, and other power players on the global stage. Well, it's even below my native country's uh, rate, which is 64%. And of course, uh, this is really, uh, I frankly didn't realize how bad it was until uh, I read this information that we are so far behind many other countries and helping uh, our children at that stage uh, get the best possible educational opportunity and that so many of them are left without any. And so right there, it seems to me, we, we really have a problem because if someone is born into a low income, low education family, and uh, basically is going to enter life, the life journey, and if you want to call it competition with the rest, uh, with those disadvantages and then as they move into, into their first three years of life and beyond, uh, they are not given the opportunity to try to catch up, to at least uh, not get farther behind because of the lack of opportunity at this stage, then we are only complicating matters for that population. And that's what happens uh, primarily with uh, lower income and uh, minority populations because the race of attendance by race and ethnicity really vary. And in 2015, according to the National Center for Education and Statistics, whites and Asian Americans uh, participated in those programs at rates over 40% compared to African Americans at 39% and Hispanics at 30%. So that, that are already uh, significant differences there. And of course, uh, Latino children have uh, historically had much lower participation rates in preschool education and much higher rates of poverty in parental undereducation. As uh, the Casey Foundation uh, reported in 2013 that about 34% of Hispanic children uh, lived in poverty in 2011 compared to 14% of non-Hispanic white children. And uh, national, nationally, the average was 23%. And so you have poverty and uh, lack of uh, educational opportunity going hand in hand, right from the get going. And one um, out of any racial, uh, any racial or ethnic group, Latino children were the most likely to have a head of, of household who lacked a high school diploma. And roughly 42% of Latino children lived in a single parent home compared with 25% non-Hispanic white children in 2011. Frankly, I was uh, surprised by the 
uh, the, 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 the disparity, the, the, the magnitude of the disparity here, uh, but that's the way it was reported uh, at that time. So when we start the race of life so far behind and with more obstacles than the rest, it shouldn't be surprising that so many young people in uh, communities of color, particularly in low-income populations, uh, don't graduate from high school at the rate that, that other populations do, and certainly don't go to college at the same rate and, and graduate. So that is, uh, frankly, in my mind, uh, poverty, the, the effects of poverty clearly uh, impacting on educational uh, opportunity and attainment. Now, uh, is that, I'm done? No, you've got, uh, okay. you've got a minute. Oh, uh, a minute. Okay, well then, uh, I didn't know I could, I would talk so slow, but let me see. And, and Latinos get a drop a rate of 29% in 2000 compared to 13% of blacks and 6% of whites. But it used to be much, uh, I mean, that was back at that time. Since then, it has gone down significantly for all groups. And the good news is that, again, we're all moving up in college completion-wise. It's a different story. We, we have problems there more severe than you would suspect uh, to be the case. And uh, let me just very quickly say that altogether about 55% of those students who completed a degree or certificate within six years of entering a higher education institution, uh, uh, but broken right down by race and ethnicity, the race fluctuate between uh, by up to 25% because uh, Asian and white students pretty much uh, complete their degrees within those six years at a rate of about 63%, whereas Hispanics and black students are way below at 45 and 38, 38% respectively. Uh, I could, if I had time, but I don't, but let me just say in closing that uh, I think this is a critical issue for the nation as a whole, not just for uh, communities like the Latino community or African American community that uh, educational opportunity becomes more uh, a reality than just uh, an aspiration in our nation because just in recent months uh, the Department of Labor reaffirmed a projection that about 74 percent of all the new workers joining the American labor force during the current decade will be Hispanic. 74%? That's almost three out of every four new workers. And of course, if we as a nation uh, don't do a much better job at educating them for the uh, very highly demanding, highly skilled new jobs of our economy, obviously as a nation, we would be at risk. So that's why it's so critical that we really invest in more significant ways in the institutions that are educating the overwhelming majority of these young people. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. We're going to hold again our questions till the end. Uh, our next presenter is Otis Johnson, Jr., who is Associate Professor in the Departments of Sociology and Education at Washington University in St. Louis. He is a Education and Social Policy PhD alum, uh, graduating in 2003. Otis, please. Good morning, everyone, and um, I'd like to thank the Bicentennial Celebration organizers, um, Dean Collins and, and Director Lamb, and then, of course, Dr. Sellers for the wonderful introductions and moderating the panel. Um, the advice we were given uh, suggested we should address um, educational disparities and whether we're making progress. I have put researchers here in the parentheses because I think there is a measure of progress we need to make in translating our research into policy and <clears throat> in a way that impacts educational disparities. And I'm assuming it's this button. 
Yeah, there we go. Um, so um, I have an interdisciplinary background here at Michigan. Uh, I was in education and social policy. I had a committee made up almost entirely of professors from the Ford School, but then took a lot of my uh, um, courses in the Department of Sociology. So I then ended up um, having a Spencer postdoc at the University of Chicago where I worked with Tony Bright in education in both sociology and of course uh, I had a great group of mentors here in Sheldon Danziger and Steve Roddenbush who is my dissertation chair um, in shaping my perspective um, and then moved on to be in a department of African American studies and now <laughs> I'm in a department of education in sociology uh, split 50-50 and also in the uh, Institute for Public Health. I'm interested in social justice. A lot of the issues that we face are the critical ones facing our nation. Um, and so my research really is an extension and an expression of those, those topics as being increasingly important, not only for me and, my, and, and relating to my social background, but also for the public in general. And policy is also uh, an interest of mine I'm interested especially in how we are translating research into policy uh, in order to move the needle on a lot of these social inequalities. So I tend to take this uh, triangula triangulated uh, approach to my topics. One, neighborhoods. I'm acutely interested in segregation and um, all of those other factors, social mechanisms within neighborhoods that relate to schooling and then also are either ameliorated or exacerbated by social policy. Social control is the way that I am thinking about this. And when I'm, I say social control, I'm talking about formal social control, meaning the impact of institutions and then also how those um, institutional practices are actually systematic. When I say control, I'm interest, interested in the control of black and brown bodies, which seem, seems to be um, one of the pressing issues given our uh, current environment with policing within neighborhoods and schools. I'm also interested in racial and social segregation, economic segregation as well within neighborhoods, and the social purpose of schooling, and then policing in both contexts that alters opportunity structures and the character of, of schooling, especially in charter school environments. So first, I want to say that we should um, think about this prompt here. Imagine a member of a racial group growing up segregated from another racial group, being socialized to undervalue and fear those neighborhoods and schools, and then as an adult serving as a police officer in their neighborhoods and schools. So here we have the uh, background or the impetus for a lot of what's going on uh, arising in neighborhoods and how socially separated we are. So one of the studies that I've been working on that proceeds from that assumption is the Fatal Interactions with Police Study. Uh, and it's a collaboration between multiple universities, the Washington Post, and WashU. Um, because we really have a dearth of data out there on policing and how um, that policing impacts youth development. Um, here we have a data set that we've basically created from crowdsourced data reports. Uh, we now have uh, identified 1,762 fatalities that have happened within a 20-month time span, merged those data with the Law Enforcement Management Administrative Survey, which is our nation's nationally representative data set of police agencies, geocoded those data so that they are linked to the uh, location of the fatality, and so now we are moving into the analysis, and what have we learned? We've learned that we have about 88 fatal interactions with police per month, that's almost three per day. The oldest fatal interaction with police is 107 years old, and it goes to 103, 101. So we have quite a large percentage of the, the um, distribution that actually is beyond age 60. But still our age range 
and our sample is 102 years old because the youngest are very young at age five. Percentage male, 93.5 percent. And then also racial distribution. Initially, the Washington Post, who had created or cataloged really the first 800 observations, um, said that the majority of the fatalities were of whites. We now know, after um, um, identifying more of these fatalities, that the majority are people of color. So here I've calculated the odds, or estimated the odds, that someone under the age of 25 would be um, a victim uh, a fatal, of a fatal interaction with police. And we actually have found that Hispanic youth are the ones with the greatest odds of of uh, being killed by police, followed by blacks. Um, we also have looked at some other things that are promising in terms of policy. It looks as though the evaluation of criteria for officers, include, if it includes community problem solving, actually reduces those odds. And then also if there's training for um, officers, seems to reduce those odds as well. So moving into schools, if I see three or four young, and this is the quote from the Louisiana police chief. If I see three or four young bl black men walking down the street, I have to stop them and check their names. I want them to be afraid every time they see the police that they might get arrested. Then imagine entering school every day where there are police officers. So we have a problem with the pre-K to prison pipeline. Black children make up 18% of preschool enrollment, but 42% of preschool are suspended once, and 48% of preschool are suspended more than once. So we have education, we have um, not only high rates of suspension and expulsion, but we then have racial disparities in those rates. Boys receive more than three out of four out of school preschool suspensions. In Prince George's County, and I think this would be indicative of many counties and systems only if they would collect the data. Um, we actually see here that even among youth who commit crimes, we see a disparity. Here, juvenile intake at a rate 2.4 times that of whites for African Americans. The relative rate for Latinos in Prince George's County is 1.87 times higher than that of whites who have committed offenses. So we're not talking about the odds uh, that someone would be referred based on normative or adolescent, normative adolescent behavior, but ones that actually are offenders. So we've come to this realization within the work that recovering African Americans that dropped out of school would make the estimated size of the black-white test score gap actually smaller, which means that ability is really not the issue. It really is the fact that youth are being pushed out of schools and that its behavior and our expectations of normative adolescent behavior or child behavior that might be the problem and need modification. So related to that is the educational proliferation of charter schools. So charter school networks such as these listed above have adopted no excuse approaches to adolescent behavioral management or child uh, management. Um, and it results in these disproportionate um, suspension rates. Here we have um, data from New York City that in any given year, 42% of all suspensions happen in, in New York ha are, are happening in charter schools. So my research has been um, funded by NSF to actually look at these things. And um, we're interested in redirecting the pipeline from prison cells to STEM careers. Um, and the reason why NSF is interested in this is because if we're going to broaden participation in STEM, uh, we have to go to where uh, uh, people of color are underrepresented. And we could not meet our nation's uh, requirements or goals for STEM um, by focusing on the populations that are already overrepresented in those professions. One of the major findings from our work so far is that for every major disciplinary sanction, students in this sample are roughly, and this would be in the ELS and the HSLS, NCES data, in this sample are roughly 44% less likely to take an advanced math course. Students will also score roughly 0.167 points lower 
than appears on a standardized math ability test for every major disciplinary sanction. So I wanted to move on to research and policy and the question of are we making progress in translating research into practice? Um, first, I want to say that on the bright side of this, there are restorative justice um, uh, initiatives underway in major school systems in Oakland, um, on the East Coast as well, in New York and Boston school systems, and they're having positive outcomes. They are uh, related to higher GPA, they're related to greater graduation rates, um, and hopefully on the flip side they would be related to lowered incarceration, but we don't know that for certain. But we still have this research and policy misalignment that I think is really where we need to focus a lot of our attention. Though we have increases in, in um, school-based measures to control normative adolescent behavior and criminalize it, in fact, the rate of violence in, has been in the decline uh, in school systems for the last two decades. But yet, um, we have high school students suspended or expelled in school, um, and that rate has increased roughly 40% from uh, one in 13 in 1972 to one in nine in 2009. And then there's a racial disparity within that. For African Americans, the rates are more troubling. It increased from 6% in 1972 to 16% in 2011, while the rates for whites over that same period increased from three to 5%. We're also increasing our dependence on other sources or sources external to schools, mainly police officers, to manage and handle discipline. Roughly a 16 percentage point increase in uh, school resource officers from 1999 to 2008. And then this, of course, is related to other um, um, educational practices that are really alarming, where teachers might actually search students in front of officers and thereby uh, circumventing their Miranda rights or even the, the, the necessary probable cause for a search in the first place. So we need to train teachers on how to protect students' um, 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 uh, civil rights in this case. We also have zero tolerance policy still in place. Um, it prohibits the consideration of intent, of course, in all of these um, disciplinary um, actions, and it undermines the professionalism of, of staff, uh, the, the fact that discretion cannot be used. And we can have a discussion about whether that is a good thing or not, um, but my belief is that discretion is being used anyway, it's just not used in service of uh, students of color. So. The criminalization regime, however, is expanding, even though we know that the data does not support the need for this expansion. So a new Missouri statute that took effect just this year classified physical altercations between youth of all ages from a misdemeanor to a class E felony. So we need to have conversations with policymakers. We need to be translating our work in a way that it prohibits these types of policies or suggests to them at least that a different direction is needed. Um, and I'll just close on um, an interaction that just happened at the Supreme Court between um, uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who I actually met here when he's a professor at uh, University of Michigan. As he's now uh, president of American Sociological Association and Chief Justice Roberts where this, this case was about gerrymandering and there was research presented and Chief Roberts said, you know, this is gobbledygook. And while social scientists would like for our work to be recognized as empirical, as rigorous, um, we also need to be translating it in a way that it does not appear to someone like Chief Justice Roberts that it's gobbledygook. And I, I, I am not saying or in any way defending the, what I believe is a bias toward that type of work anyway. But nonetheless, I think our imperative is to translate our work 
in a way that's going to move the needle on a lot of these things and, 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 and get rid of some of these policies um, that are really supported by law. And that requires that conversation to take place. Thank you so much. Thank you, Otis. Our uh, next speaker is Susanna Loeb Barnett. She is a family professor of education at Stanford University and received her PhD here at the University of Michigan in economics in uh, 1998. She also received a master's in public policy in 1994 from U of M. Susanna, please. Okay. Uh, do you know how to get out of here? I'm unfortunately Whoops. a Mac user. Right click? I only know of one click. And shell. There we go. Uh, folder. There we go. Okay. <coughs> Here we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for having me. It's really such a pleasure to be here. I can't think of a place that I prefer coming than to the University of Michigan. I really had the best time here as a graduate student. And I, I've been at Stanford for probably three or four times as long as I was at Michigan. And I still root for Michigan in, in any <laughs> sorts of event. So I'm going to take you a little bit more into the weeds of schools, which is where uh, I spend my time. So I'm just going to start. Uh, I work with a bunch of districts, and um, they tend to be these big urban districts with strong rhetoric around closing achievement gaps and the importance of equity. And uh, I put a survey in, in, the, in one of these districts to all of the teachers and administrator and the school administrators there. And here's one of the questions. If you could set priorities for the district, which of the following five-year achievement trends for low and high income students do you think would be a more desirable goal? And I had them compare equal gains. So you can see the dotted line are the high income kids, and they, they improve over time. And the lower line is the low income kids, and they improve over time. So both groups go up, and they're equal gains. And I had this versus. And here I randomized two different choices so I could kind of get a sense of you know, how I presented it and what did it mean. They were both equal outcome choices, but one of them kind of kept the high income flat and raised the low income, and the other one made a trade-off. So it, it um, was supposed to reflect the fact that we may actually have to make trade-offs if we do really want to reach these equal outcomes. So what happens? This is just everybody got to see the, the one in the right, in the upper left left-hand corner, and then they got the choice of these two down here. So 63.2% of teachers chose uh, equal outcomes in the case where there wasn't any trade-off. But only 23% chose, chose the trade uh, to have equal gains instead, I mean, to have equal outcomes instead of equal gains when there was a trade-off. So still 23%, you might think, I mean, I'm not making a judgment at all on which is right, but this, this is the view that, that they hold. But one of the interesting things is I also asked them how important of a challenge are achievement gaps for the district, and 32% of them said that it was the most important challenge. So fewer people were willing to make trade-offs in order to reach those goals. And were, when kind of asked this broad question about the importance of achievement gaps, were really willing to say, this is the most important thing. And so this just points a little bit towards our really thinking about the words that we use and what we mean when we're talking about these things. So we, in order to explore this a little bit further, we asked them which achievement, there are a number of achievement gaps that may concern educators. Please rank the gaps listed below according to the amount of effort whoop, uh -oh, uh, you feel uh, that you should devote to each gap. And so we asked about individual achievement differences, home support gaps, which are also kind of an individual uh, difference across children. And then we, we asked about these two kind of more structural gaps that I think we're all talking about here today, income gaps and race gaps. And what you can see is that and this is in a very heavily equity focused district. The, the most common uh, gap that people were interested in were individual achievement gaps. 
And um, we also asked them, well, how do you spend your time in the classroom? How do you devote it to different kinds of students? And again, students who were low achieving got the biggest, uh, they're the ones I, the teachers reported giving the most time to, and students from more disadvantaged backgrounds was one of the least of the, one of the, the options that they took. Okay, so you might be thinking, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. If we focus on low-achieving kids, we're going we're gonna to be able to close the achievement gap. But that's just actually <laughs> probably not the case. So here's just a little description um, using actual data on fourth grade reading scores and comparing poor kids and non-poor kids in the U.S. And it's not perfectly re representative of the data because I made the lines very smooth and things like that. But what you can see, the blue are the poor children, and those are just kind of percentages in each of the achievement levels. And the, the non-poor are higher. That's the red one. But what you can see is there's a lot of variation around the gap. And the difference in average between poor and non-poor, which we might think really represents differences in, or clearly represents differences in opportunity, whereas some of the rest of the gap, the differences that you see may not be differences in opportunity. Not that they're not important to address, too, but they're, they're not these structural gaps. Um, those, those are really wide relative to the structural gap. So these aren't the same thing. And just to give you this in another uh, kind of easy way to think about this, um, this is looking between white and black students in the US um, and looking at the, the proportion of them that are below basic on this, so the lowest achieving, basic kind of middle achieving, or proficient or above high achieving. And what you can see is that the modal white student is proficient or above, and the modal black student is uh, below basic. And so you think, oh, well, I'll just focus on low achieving students, and I'll, I'll fix this gap. Well, if you take, you focus on your 10% lowest achieving students in the US, and you say, OK, I'm going to get them, I'm going to improve their achievement, you can see what that does is it does um, reduce the proportion of black students who are below basic and increases the proportion above basic. But it does the same for white students, too, because white students are a bigger group. And so even though a lower proportion is there, a fair number of them are there. If instead of this, you took the exact same number of students and increased them the exact same amount, but focused on black students instead of the low achieving students, you can get the, the distributions to look much more like each other. Now, this is just all not to say which one, which choices you should make, but just that these are different choices. And sometimes we don't have the language uh, to really talk about this in, in a, a way that's useful. There's a quote that I like which, uh, from Jenks, which is, the enduring popularity of equal educational opportunity probably derives, derives from the fact that we can all define it in different ways without realizing how profound our differences really are. So one of the things that I've been working on lately, and this is a little uh, self-promotion, sorry, is I have a book coming out with uh, three co-authors, another kind of social uh, science trained, economics focused um, researcher, Sunny Ladd, and then two normative uh, scholars, one in political theory and one in philosophy, and you still have to describe to me what the difference between that is, but Harry Brighouse and uh, Adam Swift call educational goods where we're trying to kind of create the language for this and, and um, create the language for what we're trying to produce in education as well as some of these distributive principles. Because if we think something, why, why would we care about the, uh, that things are unequal except at the bottom? Well, we we might care if we're in a world where elites have power. And I think we're in a world where <laughs> elites have power right now. And so we might want to think about kind of moving the whole, shifting whole distributions. OK, so th since I'm in Michigan, I figure I should do an example of the kind of empirical work that I do, because that's really more of what I do and really what I've learned, what I learned from being here. So I wanted to, just to give you an example of that as well. OK, so most of my work has had to do with um, addressing educational opportunities through policies focused on adults in schools. So these have been teachers and principals. And because I, that's what I feel like separates uh, kind of schools that are providing effective opportunities from those who 
aren't. But through these district partnerships that I work, I've recently added parents to that as, an, as another educator for students. Um, and they asked us, a doctoral student that I was working with, Ben York and I, to help the district increase uh, parent engagement <laughs> at little cost. So uh, that, that at little cost is always a part of what you're supposed to do. Now, there are clearly meaningful systematic variation in parenting, and these have implications for child, children's outcomes. I think we've all heard about the three million word, or 30 million, it's a huge word gap, but not only is the gap in number of words that kids hear, but the kinds of words, whether they hear positive, encouraging words, or negative words, how much warmth they receive, all of those things vary really across socio, between socioeconomic groups, but also uh, within socioeconomic groups. And so what we were, were wondering is whether we could utilize some of the new research on adult behavioral change to see whether we could help parents create positive home learning environments. Um, and basically the, the work is one, seeing if we can help uh, the parents in this district, and two, trying to understand if these are important issues in parenting more broadly. Okay, so we started this with how do parents decide what to do? And clearly there's kind of the basic economic model. Parents have goals, they have budgets of time and money, and they utilize it the best they can. And um, that's where the difference in parenting comes from. And um, I think the, the research that is out there shows that the goals for parents are pretty universal. Everybody wants the best for their children. Money is not, budget constraints are not, and it's really important to consider budget constraints. We know money makes a difference on, on parenting. Um, that's just not an opportunity we had at this point. So then there are issues of information. You know, Mary, maybe different parents have different kinds of information about uh, how, how to help their children. But even if they have that information, it's possible there are the, these behavioral barriers so that parents aren't using their resources and the information they have uh, to reach their goals. So that's what we decided to focus on because we didn't have any money. Um, so why would behavior, why would these behavioral barriers be an issue in parenting? Well, we thought of three that would, might be important and um, I think actually they turn out to be very important. So one is cognitive load. When you think of, oh, I pick up my five-year-old at school or my three-year-old, I'm more focusing on young kids here. Um, how challenging can it be? How cognitively challenging? But if you think there's like, there are a million questions you can ask and you have to choose a question from there or a million games you could play and you have to choose something from there. We know from really interesting research largely in marketing, that having choices is really debilitating. If you have too many choices, particularly if you've got a lot of other things going on, you can just freeze and not do anything. I don't know what question to ask, I'm not going to talk. Um, so cognitive load is one thing we were trying to get around. Attention is another. There's been a lot of work that's something you have to do over a long period of time, like parenting, which you have to kind of do forever. Uh, it's very hard to hold attention. Savings, exercise, those kinds of things. So we wanted to think, can we do something to help parents hold attention? And then the third is self-control, the issues of you know, eating cake instead of apples. Like why do we do that when the, the benefit is only about you know, a minute and a half, when the benefits of, uh, of eating apples can go for a long amount of time? That's true in parenting too. I know for me, like I'm washing, I, I see these dirty dishes in the sink and I say, ah, I really want to wash the dishes so, they're not, so it's not dirty and sitting in the sink instead of uh, playing with my child or, or doing some other kinds of things in parenting. And so I think self-control is, is a third one. And um, when you've got a lot of other uh, issues going on, trouble meeting bills, two jobs, things like that, all of these issues can become more intense, even if your goals and everything else are equal. So we use text messaging to design, and most there have been a bunch of programs on text messaging, but most have been around holding attention. Take your medicine, exercise. This is one we're trying to get through all of these things. Information, um, too much choice, cognitive load, attention, and self-control. So on Monday, we gave information in a text. On Wednesday, we gave them a really easy thing to do, like what question should you ask your child today? And then on Friday, we did that again. We gave them something easy, and we also said good job, you know, our attempt at uh, getting, getting some immediate gratification. And we did this for a whole school year. Okay, so here's an example. Fact, 
Children need to know that letters make up words. Research shows that kids with good letter knowledge become good readers. Tip, Wednesday, point out the letters in your child's name in magazines, on signs, and at the store. Have your child try who can find the most. Um, whoops, then there's a growth one. Some of them focus more on conversations. So during a meal, ask your child what your favorite, well, what is your favorite food? Why? Now tell your child what your favorite food is and why. Okay, so they were just, we did these every week. So we looked at um, the effect on parents, I guess before I put that up, we looked at the effects of par parents' reports of what they did, and that went up a lot. We had this uh, blind thing for teachers, survey for teachers to fill out that, where they talked about which parents came in and talked to them, and the parents came in and talked to them more. And uh, we got positive effects in both years that we did it in early literacy, and then we did it in math, and we got them in math. And um, you can see in the first year, which is the red bar over there, we actually didn't get an overall effect. But if we look at the lowest uh, half of the students, we got about a third of a, st a standard deviation effect, which is in the range of three months of literacy learning um, over the course of the year. And we got it in year two and pooled. So what are the implications? Well, one is that behavioral and informational barriers are issues in parenting, and that uh, more intense, more information is not necessarily better, that we have to really think about these things when we're trying to help people with really busy lives uh, do what they want to do, improve the, improve the lives for their kids. This may be, since I think about other educators, this can be an issue for educators as well. Teachers have tons of things to do. We throw professional development at them as if anybody could take a big book and then and operationalize it that, that next day. Texting can be short-lived, and so this doesn't, I just want to uh, say this doesn't rely on texting. It relies on this idea that the effectiveness of small bits of information that are well-timed could be promising. Um, we're now expanding this, uh, and we want to expand it. Uh, it's easy to scale up. It's low cost. We're, we're sending it to about 70,000 families uh, every, three days a week right now. Uh, we need to make the intervention better, and so we're doing a whole bunch of random, this was a random control trial that I showed you, but now we're doing all of them to kind of test the details. So, um, broader implications, this is very quick. There are big disparities across groups and individuals, and they have long-term consequences. That's, what, that's why it's so exciting to be in this uh, session today and, and in this convening. I, I feel like I can learn a lot, and it's also great to see so many people working on this. How we consider gaps likely determines the policy approaches we choose and also the research questions we ask. I think sometimes we're not systematic enough of thinking about what we really care about when we're choosing what we want to analyze for research. Research is, provides new insights like this, the behavioral barriers that are generative both for understanding and for effective program and policy development. So it's a kind of a very positive view, but we still have a long way to go. So thank you. Okay, our uh, first, thank you, Susanna. Our final speaker is Laura Perna, who is the James S. Ripe, uh Professor and Executive Director of the Alliance for Higher Education and Democracy. She's at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. She received her PhD here at the University of Michigan in Higher and Post-Secondary Education in 1997. Laura, would you please come forward? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm the same technologically. Uh, and show. Okay. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today for uh, so many reasons as have been mentioned. It's uh, an honor to be back and the themes that I'm gonna mention really link to so many of the others that have been mentioned already. Uh, I just wanna begin a little bit um, by reflecting on my pathway, especially for the more junior people in the room. Uh, so I received my PhD in 1997, 20 years ago, and I have a, a MPP from what's now the Ford School as well. 
My path, so you have the bio in your handout, but my path has so not been direct. And I think um, it's so much easier to tell the story of where you are in retrospect. Um, you know, I've been, I've taken a number of different positions on the way to where I am right now. I've had the opportunity to work in different types of higher education institutions. I worked at the University of Dallas doing institutional research. I worked at a policy research organization, UNCF in Washington, DC. And so I think there are a lot of different ways in which you can create um, a life and make a difference on these issues. And you know, I think the key is really just thinking about what are the best decisions in the moment and making the best decisions that you can, keeping the, uh, your eye on what you really care about. Um, and reflecting back on why I value being here so much, I think um, I learned the tools of the trade. I learned how to do what I hope is high quality research uh, with a variety of different types of techniques, understanding of different frameworks. But there are also so many opportunities that I had when I was here to engage in the work in different types of ways through different class projects, through different mentorship from faculty, different um, types of research opportunities, and then also the learning from peers. And so um, you know, the extent to which you're in this moment now and can be engaging with each other you tend to be, you end up being friends with these people and connecting with people over and over in your path. And I think that's kind of a Michigan thing, actually. Um, you know, there's so many Michigan people out there doing great work. And so it would be somehow interesting to d dissect what is it that actually happens here that makes us all directed on what I think are the most pressing issues facing our society. So I'm going to circle back, uh, you know, focus on higher education we all know that higher education is important, but I think it's also useful to look at the data. There's so many different ways to describe. And in this current climate, I think it's really important for us to be thinking about what are the data that we're using and how are we making the case consistently about what it is that we do value. So we are making these choices every day about the things that we study. And there's skepticism about whether or not the things that we care about, others should be caring about too. So this is just a picture of some of the economic benefits of higher education, but also figuring out um, and articulating the non-economic benefits of higher education, especially to our democracy, is important as well. Uh, we were asked to try to highlight good news, and so as was highlighted uh, by Dr. Flores earlier, we have increasing educational attainment, and so I think that is good news. But we continue, as be, has been discussed also across the panelists, we have these persisting gaps across groups. And so while overall the picture is getting bigger, we're making so little progress in closing gaps. When I, my dissertation was looking at the effects of financial aid on students' choice of college to attend, and um, I don't know what I was thinking, but I didn't think I'd be studying essentially the same issue now 20 years later in different types of forms. One of, so access is inc increasing overall, as you see here, the upward trend. In addition to not closing the gaps, we're, not, we're also not making great progress in, in ensuring completion. So more people are going, but we're making less progress in closing the completion gap. And this is just another way of depicting what we've heard about the differences in life chances across groups. So just 15% of students in the lowest SES quartile in the 10th grade attain a bachelor's degree within eight years of their expected high school graduation, compared with 60% of those in the highest SES quartile. Those are really big differences. We've also heard about the differences across racial ethnic groups, and then the, the gender difference within racial ethnic groups is important as well. So you know, really profound, persisting gaps in the extent to which people have the opportunity to realize the many benefits of higher education. We've heard uh, you know, many reasons why, and we all, I'm sure you're all thinking about these, uh, the reasons why these issues are important, but you know, another way of thinking about this is around the increasing racial ethnic diversity of our population. So you know, whites are the uh, minority uh, of the population now, and already and this varies across by state and the extent to which these um, trends are playing out as well too. So over the course of my career, I've had, um, I've really focused on trying to understand what is the role of public policy in improving college access and, and success, especially for students from underserved and underrepresented groups. I, I mentioned my dissertation. I've I started out doing statistical modeling of trying to understand what are the ways in which people from different um, groups and different places make decisions or are end up with different types of outcomes. 
Uh, I've done case studies trying to understand how these forces play out within high schools to try to, because the context matters. So much of opportunity is based on where you live and the schools in which you attend. I've also had the opportunity to look at how these issues play out in different international contexts, and I, that's something I would urge you to think about too. It's so helpful to have the opportunity to think about how these things work someplace else, and then you come back and re you have new awareness of what, what's happening here. I've also, uh, and there are other types of individual studies along the way, I, I want to talk a little bit about a, uh, series of studies that I did um, with a colleague at Penn, Joni Finney, understanding the role of state policy in higher education. And this has been a fun collaboration. Joni Finney comes from the policy world, and so she's, I learned a lot in terms of this issue of dissemination of findings. So I was very, orient I really wanted to get a book out of this project, and Joni kept pushing me. also have to have these short policy briefs that we send directly, actually, to the media in each state. That tended to be a way to get to the attention of the state legislators in each state. So this project really capitalizes on variation that exists across the U.S. in educational attainment. So here you can see the wide range and the share percent of folks in different states who have at least a bachelor's degree, um, varying quite widely from um, you know, more than 40 percent in Massachusetts to around 20 percent in West Virginia. And so a part of our project is to capitalize on that variation to try to understand, well, what's happening in these states with different levels of performance? So what we did is we did case studies of each state. We spent several days in each. First, we did a lot of work to learn everything that we could about each state's system of higher education, all sorts of different indicators of performance, and then spent time in each state interviewing legislators, leaders of colleges, universities, people in the K through 12 system, et cetera. Our five states were Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, Texas, and Washington, and they span across that continuum of educational attainment. I won't go into too much depth given the time about what it is we found, but in short, as you can see by the titles here, the stories were quite different across states. One constant was the uh, all states are experiencing uh, gaps across groups in educational attainment. So the really important ways in which systems are serving to perpetuate disparity essentially through the public policies that are and are not in place. This was uh, most profound in Georgia. Georgia is a low performing state in terms of educational attainment and really big gaps across groups, especially for blacks versus whites. And blacks are a large share of the population of Georgia. Illinois is a state that had very high attainment in the 90s and then steadily was experiencing, for a variety of different reasons, declines, especially with regard to the support of need-based financial aid. Maryland, a high-performing state, but really those persisting gaps, especially between blacks and whites, and also uh, Baltimore versus the rest of the state. Um, Texas, uh, Interesting, a lot of uh, rhetoric, and, well, and real plans towards, they have a strategic plan called Closing the Gap, oriented toward, orienting towards uh, improving performance. In the time that we were there, there was also an initiative to improve the, um, the number of highly ranked research universities in the state. And so what this title really gets at is this issue of choices. What do we really care about? Do we care about closing attainment gaps, or do we care about the prestige of our public research universities? In Washington, uh, one of the issues there was around the role of state policy leadership versus the um, interest of the public four-year institutions in having more autonomy, and so that push and pull. So whose interests gets, get advanced? So really different stories. What we came up with from that is a conceptual model that tries to un uh, articulate how these different things come together um, so that we can think about ways that we might productively, productively improve attainment. And the foundation is recognizing that each state is different, the state context matters, the number of different types of institutions is an important characteristic, the characteristics of the, of the population in terms of demographics, economics, and so on. Um, the circle gets at the types, the categories of policies. So we did not in, the, in our project try to identify if you just do this one, if you implement this one policy, you'll solve your problem because I don't, it's more complicated than that, obviously. 
So we have these categories of policies that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. And then, but underlying that is really uh, the role of state policy leadership. And I think this is something, uh, so we collected data in 2009 through 2011, which is the height of the recession, right? And so it's quite interesting to see how states were thinking about the funding of higher education. Um, the issues though, you know, funding matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. Policy leadership matters in terms of setting goals and figuring out how to align the priorities of the state um, with other interests. The one, if I were gonna do the model now in retrospect, somehow I would put equity in the picture um, because that really, I think, if we're gonna make a difference on these issues, the policies and practices that are in place have to be aligned towards improving equity. So just briefly in terms of the categories of policies, all states had that we studied had this misalignment between um, the needs of people in particular places within a state and the types of opportunities that were available. And this was uh, most dramatic in Texas. Texas is a large, diverse state with very different things happening in uh, Dallas and El Paso and other parts of the state. One way that this, this plays out is in terms of the types of institutions that people of different groups attend. And so low-income students, first-gen students, racial, ethnic, minoritized groups tend to attend institutions that are close to home. Um, low in this shows the great concentration of low-income students at for-profit institutions and the really low representation at the most competitive institutions. And there was a report that came out about 10 days ago that that bottom line is getting worse. So public universities, we're sitting in one. Uh, the share of low-income students at the most selective public institutions is going down, and it's uh, and that share from high-income families has been increasing. So this problem is persisting. The second category is around thinking about the strategic use of available fiscal resources. And this really gets at, so we tend to think about policy in isolation. So how are you gonna figure out how much state appropriations to allocate? What's gonna be the financial aid policy? How are we gonna set tuition? But it's, affordability really depends on how all those things come together. There was a report actually released this morning by the State Higher Education Executive Officers, GEO, that said uh, only a third of states think about how those things come together intentionally. They, states continue to make these policy decisions in isolation. This, play, this plays out in a variety of different ways. So most, uh, this is for low income students, so students who are enrolled in college, the top line is the, it's showing the average amount of unmet financial needs, so um, uh, how much money is not co covered by financial aid essentially, and low income students have the most unmet financial need, which leads to, there are only so many ways to pay college costs, right? So if you don't receive enough grant aid, loans is one way that you, our system requires you to pay college costs. More and more students are borrowing. This is just for students who are earning a bachelor's degree. Um, the real problems with borrowing are around those who take loans and don't finish. And as we mentioned earlier, only about 55% of students who enter a four-year institution on average complete within six years. So there's a lot of risk in our system, especially for first-gen low-income students of color. The amount of debt is rising. Uh, another category of policies has to do with thinking about how our systems fit together. So we are losing students as they try to navigate their way between K through 12 education and higher education and how they uh, move from one higher education institution to another. So despite a lot of attention to developmental coursework and remedial education, uh, you can see here the shares of students who are taking at least one remedial course and really little improvement over this uh, almost a decade. We also, um, many students are also attending more than one institution as you can see here. I'm going fast because I'm almost out of time. Uh, but there's a real problem with lack of, with transfer of credits. And so you can imagine that the students who are harmed most by these failures of our system essentially are those who are low income, first gen, um, students of color, those least sophisticated and with, uh, who our system is really failing in lots of ways. So just to conclude and reiterate the point that's been made several times in different ways, there's so much more work to be done to address these system systemic and structural barriers to opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna invite the panel to uh, come forward 
And uh, please join me. And uh, also uh, put on your mics. And while we're doing that, uh, I'm actually, before I throw open to the audience, I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative and throw out the first uh, uh, question. And it's a, a brief question I'd like each of you to address uh, uh, pretty briefly. So uh, from a, one of the goals of the panel today is really to talk about not only research, but research as it relates to um, policy. And the panelists have done a, a wonderful job. And so I'm going to actually throw out uh, this question. Please identify who is the most important policy maker with respect to the work that you do. And if you had 30 seconds to talk to that person right now, what is it that you would say? And you have 30 seconds. <laughs> Antonio, why don't we start off at the end? Well, uh, in, in our case, uh, it's probably the chairman of the Senate Committee on Education, Health, uh, and uh, Pensions. And uh, that, that individual holds a lot of power. The Senate is obviously, as you know, each senator really is very powerful in, in terms of uh, processes, parliamentary procedure. And uh, I think uh, if we could uh, have an opportunity to really present a particular issue or case to the chair of the Senate uh, committee, uh, that would be my choice to do it with that individual. And um, essentially, that's the most important person that I can think of at this point in my work. So uh, in 30 quick sections, what would you say to Well, obviously, three things. One is that uh, investments in higher education uh, really are great investments that pay off uh, for society and for the economic advancement of, uh, of the nation because they respond to that particular point of, of what, is the, what is the gain, the economic gain particularly for the nation for whatever investment. The second thing is, uh, what would be some of the uh, ramifications or, or uh, gains also in other aspects of uh, social behavior, if you will, like the decline in delinquency rates, the less investments needed in incarceration, and of course, uh, everything that goes with uh, the criminal and justice system. And, and, and that I think it will be sort of part of the same conversation. And the third thing is that, of course, uh, our nation is increasingly becoming a minority, majority country that needs, because this is what I do, is I advocate for a particular constituency, and that uh, these particular populations are the most, um, the most impacted by those policies, and therefore, they really need to part particularly pay attention to those populations. Well, some of the research that was presented alluded to the fact that, in, the, in your case, like if you really zero in on, on black students, then as opposed to social law socioeconomic, then you see the gains. And, and I think that, that goes for higher education as well. So they have to invest in particularly the institutions that are educating the uh, overwhelming majority of these populations. In, in our case, it would be Hispanic-serving institutions. So, so those are the three points that I would make uh, to the good senator, and that's it. Susan. Susanna, I'm sorry. That, that, that's okay. Um, I respond to a whole range of different names. Um, it's actually a really hard question in K-12 education because K-12 education is decentralized. The federal government actually doesn't have legal jurisdiction to regulate uh, education in the US, it's, that's given to the states. And so if I wanted to do something at a high level, it would probably be at the state level. In California, we're a low spending, high cost state. If I were talking to the, the new governor, I would probably focus on the fact that we're low spending. We have one of the fewest number of adults in the, in the system of any uh, school system in the country. So we have fewer teachers, but more fewer social, uh, 
counselors and librarians and all of that, so I would focus on that. Um, but again, because you may get better um, outcomes by decentralizing even further, so giving power to districts and to schools, I would actually probably choose to, to talk to the superintendents of uh, large urban school districts. And in that case, I would encourage them to utilize the, some of the new technology to make sure that we trace each student as they go through. We now have the ability to do that, to actually look at each child, what that child knows, what they respond to. And it's just ridiculous that we're um, not doing that, even in you know, Silicon Valley where I am. So I, I would focus on the children and what, what they're learning and our ability to uh, reach them. Uh, Susanna's is right in terms of the, um, I guess, the federal versus the state, and, and really it is a hard question because I'd like to address both. But at the federal level, there are um, uh, some policies that, while maybe are not educational policies, they definitely have implications. So um, I would want to talk to Congress um, about zero tolerance legislation that really came out of the war on drugs. Um, about drug-free um, and uh, safe school zones. Um, again, more legislation that came out of the Clinton era, um, and they continue today. Um, also, the fact that charter schools and the proliferation of those forms of education tend to have advocates within um, these administrations and definitely support within the U.S. Department of Education. So there is a push from the federal level for more charter schools. Um, so I think I would say the one thing I would say to um, Congress on, uh, related to those issues is that uh, there's a tremendous human capital loss related to punitive um, um, social control regimes and the overcriminalization of youth and people of color. Laura? Great, thanks. Um, this is such a great question for many, a lot of different types of reasons that have been mentioned. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to testify to Congress, and I took, after that, um, I actually have a paper under review trying to understand and think about the use of research in the federal policymaking process in congressional hearings in particular. Um, you know, academics are not commonly called um, relative to other, there are people who are in other policy research types of organizations who are called pretty frequently um, in DC and whatnot. There does seem to be, on the more positive side, a you know, real interest among legislators to have research and data to support the things they want to do. Um, and so I think figuring out, you know, Otis's point earlier, figuring out how to disseminate and make sure that folks are aware of what we know is super important. You know, there are certainly a lot of federal policies pertaining to these issues that I, um, I think are important to communicate, especially around loans and gainful employment and making sure that we protect low-income students from low-performing institutions. Um, but I, at this point, you know, I'm really thinking a lot about the state policies around free tuition. Uh, so I have a project on College Promise, free tuition programs right now. And what I would communicate with folks would be to think about the unintended consequences of the ways in which some of these programs are being structured. So they're uh, largely last dollar programs, so they're a supplement to whatever aid is already available through the Pell Grant or any other need-based state aid. And so the dollars that are going to be awarded largely are not going to low-income students. They would go to other students with higher incomes, and they're not recognizing the other financial costs of going to college, so typically they cover only tuition and fees. They also tend to channel students to attend particular types of institutions. So the Tennessee Promise, for example, is available for people that attend technical and community colleges, but we know, which uh, could be a good thing, but we have to think too about the pathways from those institutions to four-year degrees and the extent to which folks can transfer seamlessly from those institutions. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yes. Hi. Hi, sir. Um, 
really interested in the research you just presented on variations in attainment across states and the role of state policies. And I'm curious what we know about variations in attainment specifically and in inequities across institutions of higher education um, and the role of school policies in potentially sort of leading to those variations. I'm curious if any of you can speak to that or if you know who's doing that type of research. Yeah. There are certainly folks who are looking at those issues. And um, so I have a project now that is trying to identify practices of institutions that enroll high shares of Pell Grant recipients and also have high rates of graduation of Pell Grant recipients. Um, and there's, we're in the early stages of that. Part of the challenge is there's a lot going on in terms of different types of policies and practices. Uh, there's a report actually out, I don't know if you subscribe to Inside Higher Ed, that's a daily um, trade, whatever. And I, I believe it's in there um, today. There's a new report from the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. I think it has 11 tips for improving graduation, actually. And may, that might be a good starting point for you. Um, just to think about the categories of strategies that work, that work from an institutional perspective. Uh -oh. Just one other place to look. Raj Chetty and John Friedman have a recent report that really looks at all institutions and how well they do at graduating uh, first-generation students and low-income students. Um, my... Um Reflection on your question is, is more about uh, the broader processes that are in play for policy shaping and, and, and uh, Congress particularly. And of course, there is a very strong interest in looking at uh, a measure such as uh, time to completion of degree and a measure such as the rate of graduation, of actual graduation. And thirdly, uh, gainful employment, as they call it. Obviously, there is a lot of pushback from some sectors like the for-profit uh, higher education institutions and technical schools that don't like the last one because they do so poorly in terms of uh, the kinds of jobs that people actually get and don't really earn that much. And, and they, don't even can, they cannot even pay back their loans. And so there is a push nationally to what, broadly speaking, they define as accountability, institutional accountability. So I think for those of you who are interested in researching uh, things that are related to policy, that those will be great areas of study to pursue. And, um, and so uh, the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act may actually be started in earnest this coming year and some of those issues are going to emerge. So uh, it's, it's important that the higher ed community is prepared to, to respond to them and to actually proactively seek some improvements in the act. Uh, institutionally, we know that there are, uh, there are really already all kinds of studies, but one that comes to mind that it has to do more with um, the ranking of, of, of institutions vis-a-vis uh, -vis different measures is, I think, one out of Stanford that uh, is the project for uh, project for opportunity in education. That was the one I was <laughs> Okay. And interestingly enough, if you look at the rankings of, of that project, which is done by researchers both from Harvard and Stanford, uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, work they're doing, Actually, you go to their website and see the top 10 ranked institutions, and it has to do with the added value for individual students that the experience of going through a college education uh, forced them uh, is not Harvard, is, is not the Ivy Leagues. At the very top is, U, uh, is California State University, LA. And among the top 10, there are five Hispanic serving institutions. Okay, so, uh, because again, there the point is, is not so much about, uh, you know, how fast you complete your degree or uh, how well you do, et cetera, but what is the added value for the individuals who go through the experience 
coming from where they come and where they end after graduation in terms of their socioeconomic upper mobility. I would just add to that. Um, uh, I'm not certain if you're interested in a more micro treatment of the issue, but I know Anthony Jack at uh, Harvard has done quite a bit of work on how uh, Pell eligible and, and minorities within the, the more prestigious institutions. Um, I think his work was based uh, in some New England school. Um, relate to uh, persistence and, and just really the, the issues of student life. In one of his examples, he, he talks about how uh, people during the school break, maybe winter recess, actually go hungry in some of those institutions because no one is thinking that lower income students have different needs than the majority. So he, he presents some really interesting work on um, uh, those experiences within those contexts. So I'm not certain he's talking about graduation rates in particular, but they're in, in his work, uh, institutional responses are implicated and he, he might have done subsequent work about how those schools actually responded to those student needs. Hi, my question's for Otis. Um, thank you so much for your talk, that was really great. I wanted to just invite you to say a bit more about zero tolerance policies as you see them and your research on, on these policies. And in particular, I was really curious when he said that you already think that discretion's being used in many cases, um, just not with students of color. And I, I, yeah, I wanted to know if there's like really good research being done on that question. Yeah. Well, there's... Sorry, yeah, my name's uh, Mercy Corridor and I am a PhD student in philosophy. Work that's being done on the issue is really um, coming from a lot of the advocacy groups. Uh, so I would look to the Advancement Project as one. I know Judith Brown Dianis does um, quite a bit of, of work in that area. Um, the way we see zero tolerance, and, and this is coming from the field, not necessarily from um, research studies. But I get calls all the time from individuals, families, um, administrators at school systems wanting to know how to circumvent um, this, these automatic suspensions and expulsions from school systems um, where discretion and intent is not, you know, not available or consideration of intent. And I'll give you an example. In Chicago, I had um, um, I had a phone call from someone in Chicago where the student was in a fight and I think during the altercation the principal might have been hit while trying to break up the fight. Um, so there was an automatic expulsion. This was CPS, Chicago Public Schools, automatic expulsion. Um, there is an appeal and during the appeal process the principal actually um, um, supported the student and said, this is one of my best students. Uh, the person did not intend to hit me. And uh, the, the expulsion was upheld. So what zero tolerance does in effect is it removes discretion. Um, it, it removes also professionalism, meaning that we would think that teachers and school leaders would know best their students and how to manage their behavior. But that's not what zero tolerance allows for. Um, the thing about discretion though, and I had put a little asterisk on it, because um, some people would suggest putting discretion back into these decisions will not get rid of the disciplinary gap. It, it might be a product of the things that we prescribe to the system. Bias, racial bias, whether it's conscious or disconscious or unconscious, the fact is that people exercise discretion in biased ways. So um, my response to that is, is sis that systems tend to um, conform to the type of populations they serve. And we just see fewer automatic expulsions within white, predominantly white schools, even that are under the same type of zero tolerance mandates. So um, in that case, discretion, if it was 
um, allowed in, in some urban schools um, by some school systems, then we might actually see a decline in the disciplinary gap. Hi, I'm, I'm Derek Darby. I'm a philosopher here in Michigan. Um, one of the things that your work shows collectively is that inequality is a complex social problem that merits uh, serious scholarly attention, the attention of people that are doing advocacy and policy and so forth. And as Michigan products, you all know the one of the great virtues of this institution is the emphasis on collaborative, interdisciplinary research. And I thought it'd be nice if you could share some of your thoughts about how scholars can more effectively come out of their silos and frame research questions about inequality, understanding it, thinking about his causes, his consequences, his, his, his history, and thinking about how that knowledge can be communicated, disseminated to people who make decisions about the rules and the policies. Because um, I think we got a real opportunity to use the resources we have at these great universities to impact policy. But I think if we don't appreciate the complexity of the problem and that it requires knowledge that we all don't have individually, then we, we don't put ourselves in the best position. So maybe you can sort of free associate on that one. Done? Yeah. Uh, is that there are at least uh, two important levels at which that could occur, and, and one of them, of course, is uh, the uh, disciplinary level uh, across not just within institutions but uh, among institutions and people who have uh, some common interests in the issue of inequality from different uh, disciplinary perspectives uh, coming together and promoting that uh, in a very intentional way themselves to reach out to others that are doing uh, similar work but from a different perspective to create uh, collaborative uh, work across, again, institutions or even within institutions. Um, but uh, at a more sort of macro level, uh, you, generally speaking, uh, academics belong to different guilds or associations. And those associations, I think, need to work more closely together uh, to create the national enterprise in a more purposeful way, in a more systematic way, and in a sustainable manner uh, for policy change. Uh, I don't see much of that going on, frankly. Uh, I don't know about the in, in, intra-institutional or inter-institutional, but at the national level, I don't see much of that. And uh, there is plenty of room for collaboration across uh, sort of uh, guilds, if you will, of different disciplines. Um, so I think of this as kind of the two steps that are useful. One is this book that I did with these two philosophers came out of uh, this organized collaboration that Danielle Allen and Rob Reich put together on education, justice, and democracy, where we met for about a week three times uh, in a very interdisciplinary group to discuss these kinds of issues and produce something. And then out of that came a number of collaborations that then took us five years or whatever it was uh, to actually produce something. So I think these kind of organized, longer term collaborations among um, academics is really important to actually make progress on these kinds of issues. But then there's a question of how you then move that to policymakers. And right now I'm running this thing called Getting Down to Facts for the State of California, where we've got about 30 researchers creating research uh, reports 
to help support the new governor. We're electing a new governor next year um, so that they'll all be ready to give them information and we're writing the reports and then we're putting them into basically two pagers and then we're doing a summary and a two page of that to make it really accessible. But even with all of that, we actually have another whole group of people who are right now going around one on one to kind of policymakers and advocates and all the stakeholders to kind of get them ready as much as possible to be willing to discuss this, to feel like they had input into what's there and what's not there. I don't know if this will work. We did it about 10 years ago and we didn't do as good a job on the second part as we're trying to do now. Um, but it is a, it's a large scale, multiple foundation work to get the, what we're hoping will be an engagement between policymakers and researchers. So I think we have to be willing that we have to, uh, we put a lot of money into universities to produce this research in order that we need kind of some investment in the translation. And it's not just translating into words people understand, but the kinds of interactions you need to, to engage with those words. I would agree with that. The other thing I would add is really relates back to my experience here at Michigan. It, it really is a matter of training in, in some cases. I mean, we uh, have here at the University of Michigan a, a, a really different environment. I mean, it, 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 there are very few barriers for you to go into other disciplines, take courses. Um, and so here I just really flourished with uh, um, all of the resources and the, the opportunity to actually to craft a truly interdisciplinary vision of some of these social problems and some of the remedies. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing is that I'm, I'm also director of graduate studies for the Department of Education. And um, I've been having this conversation about public dissemination and publicly engaged scholarship and what should be happening within these doctoral programs um, uh, for our doctoral students in equipping them to, to be more successful and to also um, um, be more likely to initiate those type of dialogues with policymakers uh, and not just, you know, the paradigm of, of institution to, to policy making, but also to the public. Uh, so we have uh, public intellectuals on TV all the time. Um, what is the model of public engagement? Uh, what's the difference between a public intellectual and a popular intellectual? Because I do believe there's a difference. And it's this type of knowledge we do not give normally our graduate students in the program. So um, those are the, the two things I, I would say that, you know, we need to get out of our uh, comfort zones, our disciplinary comfort zones, and, and, and think about ourselves uh, more interdisciplinarily, and that will then lead to some type of innovation that bridges those divides. But then also we need to train the next generation to do the same. So, and I guess I'll just circle back and express a couple things. Uh, so, I feel so fortunate, really, to have had the opportunity to have been here. So, I have the master's in public policy from the Ford School, which emphasizes economics and political science. And I remember having, I still remember going and having conversations with Sheldon Danziger as I was trying to figure out my future. And he sort of uh, helped me understand at that point the importance of interdisciplinary types of perspectives and being based in a particular issue that I cared about. I also, so I think just um, a couple, to play on a couple of things that um, a little bit more that have been said, I think there are big and small ways to do this over time, right? And depending on other constraints and issues in your life, collaboration takes time, right? It requires trust, it requires relationships. I think um, there's, and, and some things that I was able to do here um, to think, help me think about my work was to connect with people at this university who are involved on the policy and practice side of things. So I was in town actually about two weeks ago for the 60th anniversary of the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education. And I saw Tom Butts, who was then working in government of, 
leading the government affairs issues for the university. He came back for the reunion. He was so helpful to me when I was a doctoral student understanding direct lending policies, which were just happening. And he still remembered talking to me, you know, 20 years later. Lester Motz, who used to be in the provost's office, was super helpful and helped me understand equity and diversity issues from a higher education practice perspective. So I think there are lots of ways to connect and develop those relationships now with people at different stages. Um, and then one other thing to think about in terms of potential funding, so the William T. Grant Foundation is really interested in this translation between research and policy and practice. And that may be, you might just look at um, how they structure their call and the types of products that they're putting out there as a way to think about these issues further. Thank you. So please join me in uh, thanking the panel. There can be no doubt that we are off to a great start and uh, look forward for the conversation to continue. And I will turn it over to David. Okay, thanks, Rob. That was a great uh, first session and a great way to get things started. Um, we have lunch across the hall. Uh, you were supposed to RSVP for lunch, but I think we have room for everybody. So if you want to, if you want to have lunch, uh, it's over in the assembly hall uh, across the hall, and we can continue the conversations there and we'll resume at uh, at 1.30 with the next session. So thank you for coming.